Thank you for joining me. You are watching a preview of my upcoming Rumble exclusive live show, which will debut January 2nd. The new show will be live streamed for one hour, Monday through Friday, exclusively on Rumble, with segments released on other platforms. Be sure to follow me on Rumble so you never miss a show. Recently, a trove of just over 13,000 documents about JFK's assassination was released by the National Archives. Many believe the documents give more evidence to the CIA being responsible for the assassination of a sitting U.S. president. Though about 97 percent of the documents have been released, there are still some that haven't. What's in those documents? Tucker Carlson claims to have spoken to someone who has access to them, and that person claims they point the finger at the CIA. Let's watch. We spoke to someone who had access to these still hidden CIA documents, a person who was deeply familiar with what they contain. We asked this person directly, did the CIA have a hand in the murder of John F. Kennedy, an American president? And here's the reply we received verbatim, quote, the answer is yes. I believe they were involved. It's a whole different country from what we thought it was. It's all fake. After Tucker's broadcast, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. also stated that his uncle was killed by the CIA. Here's his tweet. The most courageous newscast in 60 years. The CIA's murder of my uncle was a successful coup d'etat from which our democracy has never recovered. Well, if this is true, the implications are enormous. Ryan Grimm from The Intercept recently published a piece going over some of the new details discovered in the latest drop. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Yeah, it's nice to be here. How you doing? You're looking very festive, very Christmassy. <laughs> Happy holidays. Um, so in your piece, I want to go over this a bit, but in your piece, you go through Oswald's history leading up to the assassination from him being discharged from the military with false claims of his mother ill health, um, mm -hmm. how he was totally broke, but somehow took a boat to England, took a military transport to Holinsky, staying in the nicest hotels then took a train to Moscow to a U.S. embassy where he gave um, what embassy, cla embassy cl uh, staff claimed sounded like a rehearsed defection uh, speech. Like he just, mm -hmm. it was odd and rehearsed. So you then state in your piece, quote, if the series of moves from the discharge to the flight, to the defection, to the return were made at the behest of the CIA, they make sense. With Oswald playing some type of role in the inscrutable world of spycraft, absent an intelligence link, the TikTok of Oswald's post-military years would be situated somewhere between extraordinarily implausible to impossible to pull off. So it sounds like you're leaning towards, from what you've seen, that this looks more like he was connected to the CIA. Yes, and I think, the, the, and the, so a, a new document that uh, I pulled out of the archives strengthens that connection, but there's an entire uh, Oswald file that the CIA had kind of declassified previously that shows that they were very much aware of who this guy was doesn't mean that they're admitting that he was an asset of theirs but their previous denials that they had anything to do with him or they'd ever met met him you know don't don't stand up under the evidence that we have now that leaves you at at two at two possible scenarios uh, to explain a cover-up one cover-up would be uh in incompetence and embarrassment that uh this guy that the cia had been involved with for years ends up shooting the president and they're embarrassed and they want to cover up the fact that they were involved with this guy uh just the same way that you you might have the cia want to cover up the fact that they had evidence uh, uh from you know different hijackers ahead of 9 11. they would they they just don't want to they just don't oops ee, yeah. that's really embarrassing. embarrassing right or right or they're covering up complicity in the in the actual crime. Like so, those are the two explanations that people have given for you know why they might cover this up. Uh, but like I said, the, the the string of events from this Japanese uh, there was U.S. naval air base in Japan, uh, which was a, a CIA headquarters, uh, which which is where they did a lot of their kind of LSD research, and which is where they launched their U two spy planes from. You know, starting from there. Up through his, up through the assassination, his bizarre journey across the world really only makes sense if he was some type of intelligence asset. That doesn't mean that could mean all sorts of things, you know, right. because spies, you know, and spy masters have use people as pawns 
for many different reasons. And some people have floated, well, why would they send him to Moscow? Well, given that he's kind of a, a weirdo and a dunce, uh, well, maybe he was fleshing out, you know, other defectors or other, other fake defectors or spies or whatever. Like it's, it's really impossible to know, you know, what, what different games were being played. Um, but like you said, the series of events doesn't really make any sense outside of a link to the CIA. Yeah. So, okay. I understand. Like if they're embarrassed, then maybe they don't want to say anything. Although now at this point, it feels like they should be able to say that at this stage, uh, right. this many years right, later. Especially at, right. At, at, right. At this point, when you have a huge portion of the country believing uh, that you actually carried out the assassination, if you can disprove that, uh, then it's better to take the embarrassment of having a link to this guy and, and failing to uh, to stop it from happening. That, and that's why I think that interview or not that monologue that Tucker Carlson did is, is so important. He's saying right. that he's spoken to a source that has direct knowledge of what is in these documents. And the source says uh, that it, it implicates the CIA. Yeah. So we still don't have 3% of the documents. They won't release those. We have about 97% right. that have been released over the years. The majority were released a, a long time ago in this latest 13 thousand, just over 13,000. Uh, see, one one thing you mentioned in your piece uh, is that it just some redactions were lifted. You know, it wasn't like really, <laughs> truly a new load of documents that we haven't seen before. These are documents we've seen. They've just lifted some of the names. Um, right. So, OK, look, if the CIA, it, it, w w now you've got Tucker Carlson saying, I know somebody inside who's seen the remaining, these, these last 3% of the mm -hmm. documents they're not giving us. And they're saying, yes, the CIA did it. And you've got Robert F. Kennedy Jr. even saying they killed my uncle. And who knows, maybe the whole Kennedy family has felt that way this entire time. Maybe they felt like the CIA did it. Um, don't know. Mm -hmm. But you've got this, you've got these links that are coming out in these documents, the CIA not coming out saying, whoops, we're embarrassed a long time ago, we did know. And, you know, they're still not saying that. If they did it, the implications, first of all, what would it take for us to know for sure the CIA did it? What more evidence do you think we need? I mean, it, it, it's hard to imagine that there would be a memo <laughs> basically like oj's book <laughs> saying right. we did it uh but you know if you if you if there were documents that linked that that described a you know that that used code words to describe an operation um right. that involved oswald um a code name for oswald like major th you know kind of major things like that that get you closer to there you know, why are they holding back? It's it's something like three or 4,000 documents at this point when they've released, you know, tens or millions. maybe hundreds of thousands. I millions. think millions yeah. have actually been released over the years, right? Yeah. So, yeah. okay. And so, right. What? So there's only 3,000 left. Like, why? And, there, and the law that was passed in 1992 said they had to be out by 2017. And it's and past 2017. Yeah. yeah. So I doubt there is, like you said, I doubt that there's a, a memo in there saying, OK, it's go time, time to kill the it was US us. president. Right. right? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I doubt that there is that actual document. So, you know, what was really amazing about this drop and about uh, Tucker doing his piece, our, you know, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. coming out saying, yeah, the CIA did it. You're even implying it in, you know, in a way in your piece. It's just it's like. How are the American people at this point? This this drops over the weekend. This is implied over the weekend. Everybody's like, yeah, OK, you know, yeah, the CIA killed our president. All right. Anyway, next in the news. I mean, that just seems well, outrageous. A, lot, a lot of them. Yeah. A lot of people already believe it. I was looking at polls over the last decade or so. And, you know, something like a majority of Americans believe that Oswald was not you know, either was not the lone shooter or was, you know, completely a patsy. So a majority of people believe that there was a conspiracy and a majority of those, uh, which I think ends up being about a third of Americans total, believe that it was the CIA, either a rogue group of CIA agents, which is what I think is uh, more more likely, um, or, or the CIA itself. And I say rogue group of CIA agents, you're talking about the top top people in the agency, plus then Alan Dulles, who was the at this point, the former um, head of head of the CIA. And so when you're saying rogue, like it doesn't mean a, a handful of like small, you know, small ball operations people who, who went rogue. 
and did this. It would be people who did not have the instructions of, well, obviously not the instructions of the president, but also, you know, say not the instructions of the vice president. Um, there's, there are a lot of theories that LBJ was involved. I haven't seen, I've, I haven't seen a whole lot of evidence, um, that, that that's likely mm -hmm. though. There, there are plenty of people who believe that it's still possible and they're, you know, you can't, you can't rule it out. But, uh, uh when people say a rogue element of the C CIA, they're talking about this kind of domestic operations division run by, run by E. Howard Hunt. They're talking about Court Meyer, uh, James Angleton, Alan Dulles, like that, that kind of crew of people who'd been running dirty operations um, around the world. And it's the kind of thing that they had perfected in, you know, in, in Iran and in, in Guatemala um, and, and elsewhere. And then it, the our idea would be that it came, they, they brought it home. Yeah. So this would definitely undermine, I believe, everything, you know, and Tucker even mentioned that in his piece, that this is, uh, that just means that this isn't the country that we thought it was. And that it would absolutely undermine our democracy. The fact that the CIA would have the ability to kill a U.S. sitting president, undermining uh, our just everything we've ever known about this country years ago. Meaning that if they had that kind of power then and they were able to cover it up then and able to cover it up for the last 60 years, uh, what else have they been doing? You know, that would be another question I think that we have. I, 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 I'm surprised that we as Americans aren't rising up about this because I don't think there will be that memo that's in the document saying, yeah, we did it. So we're never going to get that specific of evidence. But just the implications of this, I think, you know, at some point we have to say there's enough that implies that we just have to do something about this now because we're never going to get that smoking yeah. gun. So what are we going to do about the CIA? I mean, this is, uh, it seems to me like this would be reason to abolish the CIA, that we would have to get rid of them. We can't have a rogue entity like this undermining our democracy. And in, instead, the, I, the, no, uh, the notion that the CIA may have done this has in some ways, I think, only increased their power in, in the government. Because if you think about it this way, basically every president um, since Kennedy and de we we know that LBJ believed uh, that there was some type of a deep state CIA conspiracy that that killed uh, Kennedy. Like he thought that instantly. Like he was shaking. Like uh, the stories of him. Like he like he thought he was next. Which is one reason that I've been uh, that I haven't really been persuaded that he was involved in this. Because if you if you read like first hand accounts of people who were with him that day, like he was just pissing himself that that he felt like this was like a coup that was going to come for him as well, which if he were orchestrating it, that wouldn't be how he would feel about it. But, but certainly him, uh, certainly Nixon, there's a great piece people should, could check out written in Politico several years ago that goes over a, a an audio tape between Richard Nixon and CIA director Richard Helms, uh, where Nixon is trying to blackmail Helms into backing off of the Watergate investigation by saying that if he doesn't, he's going to start exploring uh, the hanky panky, he, he calls it, around the Bay of Pigs and the quote, the issue of quote, who killed John? Mm -hmm. So basically, he's like threatening the CIA, like, you know, you, you come after me, you never know where this might lead. You, there's right. a lot of things that, that these same Watergate burglars, these Bay of Pigs people, Watergate burglars, Howard Hunt, that they were involved in, that they've been involved in before. So let's let's not push too hard uh, on this because you know, never know where it might go. So him uh, and, and, and down the line, presidents since Kennedy, I think have either known or at least suspected uh, that the CIA was responsible for this. And that has to change your relationship to the, to the intelligence agencies that you're working with. Uh, look, look, who, look who did not in 2017 release the JFK documents. Now, yeah. Donald Trump, who's like best friend, Roger Stone, is like, you know, JFK conspiracy buff number one. Right. Like, and he and he was telling people in the JFK world, like in the weeks leading up to it, he's like, I've, Trump's going to do it. I've convinced him he's going to release all the documents. Like we're fine. We're finally going to get to see everything unredacted. It's going to happen. I, and it was it was like a massive priority of of Roger Stone. And Trump was like, you know what? No, not doing it. Yeah, um, Pompeo no was for... pushing very hard against it. 
Right. Well, and, and Tucker even mentioned right. him saying, you know, like, Pompeo I... would have known yeah. about this and he does and he's unwilling mm -hmm. to talk to him. You know, I mean, and that that would imply that there is a lot of power there with the CIA that they would then, you know, if they because Trump, what does Trump care? Right. I mean, what would he care about these documents being released or protecting this? He has no motivation. I mean, Mike Pompeo right. certainly has a motivation right. to protect the CIA, but not Trump. He didn't care. So if Trump's unwilling to release the documents is because he felt threatened in some way or he was convinced you know, maybe it was like, um, yeah, maybe Mike Pompeo really convinced him, but he also very well might have been convinced through threats or some, you don't want to be the next one to have this happen to you. And that, I think, and calls he already into had, question. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. And he already had the intelligence community kind of politically ar arrayed against him. Right. You remember by, by the yeah. end of end of 2017. So for him, it's like, OK, the upside is Roger Stone and people who are you know are interested in this you know want me to do this downside is that this rather powerful entity does not want me to do it right and he and he weighed those two things and was like you know what I'm just gonna punt this to 2021. i mean it really does call into a lot of i think a lot of people who are especially very much uh, skeptical i know you and i both are of the military industrial complex and all of our military adventurism around the world and all of these coups that we've done and, and regime change and whatnot you know we we meddle a lot and I think when we look at this and if we say, OK, if the CIA had this kind of power and they're threatening presidents or even murdering presidents, let's say, um, for, you know, some people believe because JFK wanted to pull out of the Vietnam War or, you know, there's all there's all of these various different um, the CIA meddling around the world in cahoots with the military industrial complex. Largely, it just kind of makes me wonder mm -hmm. if there is a lot of this, uh, it, it, it's just much more powerful than we even thought it was. I mean, many of us know it's about money. There's a lot of weapons to be sold. There's a lot of money involved. But now when you layer this on top of it, if this is the case, this is even more powerful than we even were thinking. And it makes sense then. It's like, this is why we're in endless wars. This is why it never stops. And there's no democratic accountability, like at all, all right? Very, 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 very few members of Congress even are able to access CIA, certainly not these CIA documents, but but any uh, CIA information that CIA doesn't want to give them. You have to be kind of on the Intelligence Committee or you have to be kind of read in at the top leadership level. And there are a lot of things that the Intelligence Committees are not even read in on, that there will just be one or two members you know, who are read in on. Uh, and there's this famous quote from Jay Rockefeller, who was on the, who was the chair of the intelligence committee, uh, saying, uh, "You saying you, you don't like to, saying to a reporter, you don't understand how this works. Like you, you think that because I'm the chair of the intelligence committee, I can ask them for information, and they're just going to give me information. They give me what they want to give me, and nothing more. Like, the, and that's that's Jay Rockefeller, the chair, like chairman of the intelligence Senate intelligence committee, and so." If that's the arrangement, like, and you have on, layered on top of that, you have a lot of people, including a lot of people in positions of power, suspecting that the CIA may have done this. Uh, then you have a recipe for just an, an unaccountable, uh, you know, extraordinarily powerful uh, branch branch of government. Really, it would it would mean the United States a, a coup had already been had on this country, and we've been living under it unknowingly for sixty years, if not longer. That's what it really means. And it, that is and very yeah. scary. Yeah. And it's, and it's interesting to think we've been living with that in some ways for a long, a long time. And I wonder how it influences our politics in the sense that if you go back, um, people on what you would call the left, there, it wasn't necessarily the left at the time, but uh, the supporters of William Henry Harrison, like that story about him getting pneumonia uh, because he... Uh, you know, gave a speech in the rain. No, like people didn't buy that at the time. People felt mm -hmm. like that was a conspiracy by the slave power, by the slave owners. Zachary Taylor um, in 1848 was threatening to go to war with the South over uh, Texas, trying to like basically militarily take over New Mexico and turn it into a slave state. And then he dies. Uh, mm -hmm. And the left was, and there are plenty of people that are still convinced. I don't think so. But yeah. a lot of people were convinced that that was a conspiracy by the slave power. The assassination of Lincoln absolutely was a conspiracy there were a whole bunch of people involved and there is one one very tantalizing letter that uh went went to richmond where the confederate leaders were so there are plenty of people i think the confederate leadership actually orchestrated the assassination uh of of kennedy 
Uh, and so like in some ways, like we've been living with this kind of idea that there's some unaccountable force out there that is, is willing to use deadly force to, to override the uh, democratic impulses. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just kind of sitting there on the surface. And if you do polls, the majority of people believe that when it comes to Kennedy, but I think it's hard to like internalize and absorb that. Cause like you said, what does that mean? And then what do if we even true? do about it? You know, and then that's the other question. Right. It's like, you, then that's what do we the even reason do? you don't want to internalize <laughs> right. it. And, and I think that's right. I think that's why you don't bother to internalize it because it's, it's just easier not to. Cause what, what do you do? Like we can say you should abolish the CIA. But who does that? <laughs> yeah. Like, yes, see, where I, do we even begin? They're doing like, okay, that? cool. Yeah. Abolish us. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. Yeah, let's have a hearing yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, well, great reporting, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks for being here. This is, uh, yeah. it, you know, we'll see. We'll see if, if this actually does, tr you know, if there's more to this ever, if they do release those, <laughs> that last mm -hmm. few thousand documents, when that will be, you know, another 60 yeah, it's years. Public pressure. Know. It's Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, and public pressure is what created the 1992 act. Uh, and, you know, public pressure is the best we're going to do to release more, release more of these documents. Yeah. All right, Ryan, thank you so much for being here. Yep. You got it. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yesterday, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, showed up in Washington, D.C. to ask the Biden administration and Congress for more money. His appearance was significant for a few reasons. First, this was his first trip out of the country since the war began. But more significantly, his need to appear in person to plead for more money indicates urgency. He knows the American people's support for spending endless amounts of cash on the war is waning. It's becoming clearer and clearer. This will be another forever war. And there's no appetite for that, especially when people are struggling here in our own country to afford the basics. And it's unclear exactly what the end goal is in Ukraine. So Zelensky showed up in a tactical green sweatshirt as if he just came off the front line, met with Biden, spoke to Congress, and it seemed to have worked. Here's Biden announcing the new round of billions of dollars that will be given to Ukraine. Let's watch. And I want to thank the members of Congress and their, for their broad bipartisan support to Ukraine. And I look forward to signing the omnibus, omnibus bill soon, which includes $45 billion, $45 billion in additional funding for Ukraine. I'll also sign into law the National Defense Authorization Act, which includes author, authorities for, to make it easier for the Department of Defense to procure critical munitions and defense materials for Ukraine and other key materials to strengthen our national security. Today, I'm announcing the next tranche of our security assistance to Ukraine. $1.85 billion package of security assistance that includes both direct transfers of equipment to you that Ukraine needs, as well as contracts to supply ammunition Ukraine will need in the months ahead for its artillery, its tanks, and its rocket launchers. So where is that money going? Well, some of it is used to support a targeting list, a kill list, may some call it. Wyatt Reed is with us. He's an American investigative journalist who is currently a correspondent and writer for Sputnik News. He's done extensive on-the-ground reporting all around the world, covering coups and events throughout Latin America. But lately, he's been covering the conflict in Ukraine. His name recently appeared on a Ukrainian ministry website that doxes, targets, and lists the personal information of anyone considered an enemy to the state. This list includes Ukrainian citizens and even American citizens who are considered to be pro-Russian or unpatriotic. Many are journalists. Some are even famous, like Roger Waters, and hundreds on the list are even children. Many on the list have been killed, after which their names and faces are stamped over with the word liquidated. Two weeks after Wyatt's name appeared on the list and after disclosing his location in Donetsk through WhatsApp to a friend, Wyatt was nearly killed when an artillery strike hit only 100 feet from him as he was walking into his hotel. Wyatt, welcome to the show. This is really shocking that this is where some of this money is going. And here is Biden announcing more and more money for Ukraine. We just keep spending endless amounts. And yet some of this money is going to this list. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're able to be here. First, tell us about your experience. Like, how did you, did you know your name was on this list before the artillery strike? 
Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Kim. It's it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, it's a shame that more media outlets, news sources aren't willing to tell this story. I, as you, as you pointed out, uh, was nearly blown up by a artillery strike carried out by Ukrainian armed forces and uh, carried out, I should say, with U.S. and Western manufactured munitions. Uh, we know this because in the aftermath of that particular strike, uh, it became clear that this was a 155 millimeter artillery shell, that is to say a NATO standard uh, size, a caliber of shell. Uh, so when the British or French howitzers are getting shipped over the American M triple sevens, when they're coming over to Ukraine, they're sending 155 millimeter shells uh, towards Donetsk, towards the civilian population there, towards hotels uh, like mine, like the Donbass Palace, which is known for hosting journalists. Uh, this is all, of course, part of a broader strategy of basically terrorism, uh, of attempting to kind of uh, <clears throat> force out the population there uh, by, by military means, right? Uh, there were yes. no military targets there in the vicinity uh, of that shelling. Uh, there were simply a, a hotel and a, a downtown district, uh, which is very frequently shelled. Um, so that occurred. It was the third time in about two months that they had attempted to target that particular hotel. Um, and there's been no denunciation, of course, from the mainstream media. Uh, pretty much no coverage of it on, uh, at all outside of a handful of uh, more anti-established There you, there, you're back. <laughs> so did anybody ask you any questions? Was there anyone that came to you to investigate at all? Sure. I, I was approached by Russian media. I was approached by a colleague that works for an Iranian media outlet. Uh, I was approached by a handful of American independent journalists, um, people like Eva Bartlett, uh, who as I do basically make it their mission to try to cover these conflicts that mainstream media refuses to. Uh, but outside of that, um, I was told to maybe expect a call from someone at The Intercept that didn't pan out. Uh, I spoke with an India Indian media channel. Um, it kind of reflects really this sort of new world order that we're entering into where the US is no longer necessarily the top dog. Uh, any of the countries that have, have been um, kind of happy to see these this new sort of multipolarity play out. Uh, countries like India, countries like China, um, basically the, the rest of the world that isn't the US and Europe, um, I think have been viewing the uh, this kind of new multipolar world order um, with some level of satisfaction. Uh, they see this, uh, what's happening between Russia and Ukraine is kind of a broader struggle between the West and the rest. Um, and I think a lot of them are pleased to see that the rest uh, is winning for once. Um, and uh, obviously there are all sorts of ramifications and consequences um, in economic terms that are going to play out because of this when we talk about moving away from NATO and moving away from the G20 and towards BRICS um, and the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization. Uh, we're talking about big global shifts and I think you kind of see that play out in the media coverage. Uh, who is willing to error of viewpoint like mine um, and who isn't, that kind of reflects uh, a, a more broader vision of, of how people, how countries are reacting to this new uh, economic order that we're seeing unfold. Yeah, I mean, I'm for, for sure, there's definitely a lack of coverage. I mean, there's just kind of this echo chamber. People are getting one line from wherever they're getting it from. I mean, notoriously during this conflict, journalists haven't even been able to get from even, even the mainstream outlets, they're not able to actually get to the front lines, actually able to report. They're just hearing messages and then from the Ukrainian government and then reporting that rather than actually seeing for themselves. So this conflict has just been shielded from us, our ability to actually get true information. Um, a lot of it just looks like sort of, you know, like staged. I mean, even just Zelensky showing up wearing his army fatigues for part of it, and then this army green sweater, that that even just felt 
like he didn't have time to change into a suit during the long flight to Washington, D.C. from Ukraine. Certainly there was time when you were on the plane. You didn't literally just get transported from the front lines. So, I mean, a lot of it just feels like to many of us that this is a narrative that is being pushed on us. We don't even fully understand what the end game is. I mean, and that, I think, is the big question many of us have, is what is the end game of us giving all of this money to Ukraine? There's been this civil war going on since 2014. Russia has now occupied those and even annexed those areas of the civil war, so the Donetsk and Luhansk re region. So what is the end game you know, why are we spending all of this money? I mean, what, do you, what are you hearing? When you were there on the ground, what have you been hearing from the locals, the actual Ukrainian citizens that are there? Right, well, it's a great question. Although I, I will be frank, personally, I, I can't enter uh, what is referred to as Ukraine uh, by nature of being on this hit list, which the border guards use um, to determine who is and isn't allowed to enter. Uh, so. I spent most of my time in what is former Ukraine, but is now controlled by what the West refers to as Russian separatists, but who are really the residents of those areas, even if they now lo no longer consider themselves Ukrainians, they were at one point Ukrainians, they are the local population. Um, they in Donetsk and Lugansk, in the Donbass, are overwhelmingly supportive of Russia, um, far more so than I would say the average citizen of somewhere like Moscow even. Uh, the people in the Donbass, just at least 90 to 95 percent of them want absolutely nothing to do with Ukraine. And it's pretty easy to see why. Uh, their only interactions with Ukrainian armed forces consist of them being shelled day in and day out, over and over. Uh, there's at least several deaths every week, and there have been for years. And that's really kind of their only interaction, their, their only exposure to the Ukrainian government. Um, so, you know, what, what they've told me is basically a, this is a life and death battle. This is an existential struggle for them. Uh, they felt abandoned for years when the Russian Federation uh, was not able to come to their aid for whatever reason. Um, we could get into that a little bit later. But uh, the, the end result, you know, for them is basically it's just it's either liberation or death. Um, yeah. And from the U.S. perspective, I think there are a couple things going into this. First of all, um, there's kind of the, the, the effect that Julian Assange first verbalized around a decade ago when he was describing U.S. strategy in Afghanistan. And he said, um, the goal is not a successful war. The goal is an endless war. Uh, because basically, the, really, the, some of the only people winning from this entire war um, it, are going to be the arms manufacturers, specifically the Western arms manufacturers, and more specifically, the United States arms manufacturers, um, Raytheon, General Dynamics, uh, Boeing, all these companies that uh, you can type in and, you know, you any, any viewers at home can look up the stock prices of these companies and see how they've skyrocketed since February. Um, it's very clear who's benefiting from this. Uh, that is one aspect to it. And the other aspect is something we've heard Joe Biden vocalize, although it's usually t kind of clamped down by his handlers, um, and that is that uh, the goal is regime change in Russia. Um, that yeah, I think his exact phrase were that Vladimir Putin uh, must go, something to that effect he cannot continue to govern. Uh, this was something that Zelensky kind of referenced last night. Um, he had a specific line about uh, about the, the need to make sure that uh, that people in Russia defeat the Kremlin in their mind. Um, and so this, this seemed to refer to basically the, the, the people have to stop respecting um, their government in Moscow and basically move past that if they're ever going to be able to be negotiated with. Um, this was kind of the message. Uh, so, you know, that seems to be a demand that the United States is effectively echoing. They're certainly not uh, rejecting in public. They're certainly not going out and taking any pains to say that this is not uh, our policy currently. So, you know, I would say it's two things. They want to uh, achieve regime change in Russia and potentially balkanize the country and split it up into a series of 
uh, ethnically divided nations like they did in Yugoslavia. Um, and then they want to just sell as many weapons as possible. And, and there is kind of a third factor here, which is uh, they know that Europe is actively being deindustrialized as we speak. Uh, companies are fleeing from France and from Germany. Many of them are setting up shop in the United States. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the hundreds of billions of subsidies in the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Biden's kind of brainchild, um, that privately and publicly now, a lot of top level European officials are saying is basically going to steal our lunch. And you know, you're, you're gonna be bringing all these companies over to the United States, leaving us deindustrialized uh, and carved out. And a lot of people seem to think that this is kind of an accident or a mistake. Personally, I view this as very much uh, intentional, very much a part of the United States strategy. For me personally, I think we're going to see something like a new Marshall Plan uh, play out in Europe in the next five years or so. Uh, after Europe has basically been ground into dust, the United States is likely to move in and try to recreate it in its own image. Uh, you know, one thing, too, to, in just listening to you talking about this, the whole idea of regime change, you know, with Putin, um, I, I just see this playing out very much like it did in Cuba, right? It's like, okay, well, once Fidel Castro's gone, then everything will go back to you. And then, then we can uh, open up relations and everything's fine. And it's even when he was no longer running the country. And then when he died, they still did nothing. Nothing has changed. They just, another leader, and they pointed at that one and said, we don't like that guy either. So, it's never going to change. I mean, when Putin leaves office, whether he dies, you know, there's always these rumors that he's going to die of cancer. Or he's got something, you know, this uh, terrible, um, you know, everybody dies at some point. So even when he does die or he's no longer leader of Russia, they're going to point to the next guy and say, oh, but that he's worse than Putin. He's even worse. So I don't see that ever changing. You know, when people, when Americans think the end game of this war is Putin can no longer be in charge of Russia, that is bull. Everybody should be looking at that saying, that's not going to change a thing. They're just not going to like the next guy either. Um, and, and then also, what is the, you know, this whole idea that, okay, the, the war ends then when Ukraine is able to take back all of the territory, the Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea, when these people in these regions don't even want to be back with Ukraine. They've been in a civil war uh, Crimea has a whole different history. They never wanted to be part of Ukraine. They were given away really against their will. And uh, so, but the, the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, they've been at the civil war. And so how is this even democratic to say, this is the end game. We're gonna spend all of these billions of American dollars on trying to take back regions from a, and give those regions to a country that these people don't even wanna to belong to. And yet this is all in the name of democracy? <laughs> it's the opposite of democracy. Um, it's, it's tyranny and it's, it's everything that we hear from the, the mainstream media over the past nine months. Um, it could have been said the opposite way around for the past nine years since 2014, you know, there, there was no mention of this anywhere in the mainstream media that there was a daily artillery shelling campaign that was brutalizing the people of these regions day in and day out for now close to nine years. Uh, you can't find it. Um, and especially now, since February 24th, all these articles have basically been scrubbed from search engine optimization. So you, you really can't find them, even if they, they ever existed. Uh, but it's not democracy, no. It's, uh, it's a farce. It's very clearly a certain kind of group of elites, a transnational group of elites in the West attempting to get their way uh, to impose their will on the population of a region that's been deemed geopolitically or, or geostrategic, uh, I should say, uh, yeah. strategically important on a geopolitical sense. Uh, the Donbass is an economic powerhouse. Uh, there is an incredible amount of wheat, an incredible amount of coal. Um, it's uh, historically been a huge steel production region. And uh, it really operated in conjunction with the Soviet Union in a way that I think a lot of people don't really understand. Um, you need to have a market for these goods, right? You need to have a distribution, log logistical setup for how are you going to um, sell and move these goods around once they've been harvested or, or refined. Uh, and that uh, the consumption was always 
Russia, right? And after splitting up with the United with the, the Soviet Union, um, and after attempting to turn towards Europe, uh, many people in Ukraine found, first of all, we are not set up to be integrated with this economy. We don't have the rail lines. We don't have uh, just the, the interpersonal relationships that, that are needed. Um, and uh, so naturally, you know, they had a, quite a bit of trouble trying to integrate with the European economy. It was always easier uh, just logistically for them to integrate with Russia. And that was kind of the great fear uh, that was behind all of these provocations, whether that be the so-called Orange Revolution, whether that be the Maidan Revolution 2014, always, always, always behind this was the idea that we can slowly pull this region out of the grips of Russia and we can integrate it into the West, whether it likes it or not. Um, and uh, so I think you really kind of, you were always looking at an armed hostility situation. Uh, you were always looking at an armed conflict uh, arising from this situation since it was, since 2014 for sure, but really going back to the Bush years, even the Clinton years, um, you know, you can, you can find accounts. It's not hard from high ranking members of the so-called intelligence com uh, community, uh, high ranking former U.S. government officials, multiple former secretaries of defense um, who have all explained very clearly at one point or another that Ukraine NATO membership specifically is a bright red line for Russia. Uh, that this is viewed as an existential threat by Russia and that any attempts to, uh, to, to move Ukraine into the United States sphere of interest uh, will be met with a serious response. And, you know, very predictably, that's what happened this year in February. Um, and now we're dealing with the consequences, and I think we will be for many years to come. Mm. Well, Wyatt, thank you so much for being here. Glad you're safe. Stay safe. Um, I mean, this list is just outrageous to see the names of journalists on here, Americans, and the fact that the U.S. isn't really doing anything about it, bringing it up or even trying to prevent the funding of this. Instead, we're just throwing more money at Ukraine, throwing more money at this conflict that doesn't seem to have an end game in sight. So, um, Wyatt, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Stay safe. My pleasure, Kim. Thank you. Forty-year high inflation has caused food prices to increase all over the country. This holiday season, one in five adults nationwide report struggling with having enough food to feed themselves and their families. Here to tell us just how bleak the problem is and how, if able, we can help this holiday season is the CEO of Westside Food Bank in Los Angeles, Genevieve Riotort. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me and helping to shed light on this important issue. Yeah, so this has gotten worse, uh, food insecurity. We've always had uh, a food insecurity problem in this country. First, describe what food insecurity is. Um, so food insecurity is when someone doesn't have consistent, regular access to enough food, and not just food, but enough nutritious food to meet their or their family's um, nutritional needs. Okay. So that means maybe you have food sometimes, but not consistently. Maybe you're running out of groceries at the end of the month. Um, maybe you're only eating two meals a day. Um, it means not having consistent access to food. Okay. And you've seen that you've been doing this for a really long time, running this food bank, working in this, um, in this, in, I, don't, I don't want to call it an industry. I don't know what you'd really, sector. Um, yeah. The, has, the, the good yeah, sector. <laughs> right. Has it? Really good. I mean, we've seen record high inflation. So has it gotten worse since inflation has increased? It definitely has. I mean, we're seeing inflation for people at the grocery stores, but we're also seeing it on the wholesale level. So even when we're buying food by the truckload, the cost of food has risen dramatically. I mean, one specific example that I can point to is eggs. The wholesale price of eggs has tripled over the past year, and that's really hit us hard. Wow. <laughs> Yes, tripled it's tripled in one year. Uh, in one year. And that means we're having to cut back. You know, we used to be able to provide eggs every single week, and now we're providing eggs every other week. And there's a possibility that we may have to cut out providing eggs altogether, which, you know, it's a very popular food. It's a versatile food. 
and it's got a lot of nutrition, so that would really be a shame. Yeah, I've noticed just my grocery bill has increased. I can't imagine, you know, it, and it, it, yeah, I mean, your bill must have also increased um, the price of it. I mean, I'm always shocked just going to the grocery store, filling my cart and seeing the price, thinking that's how much all just this right. amount. Right, like, I got ten things. How is yeah, it so like, expensive? How is it a hundred dollars when this, you know, this should be so much less? Uh, it, it's just mind blowing. And and then I always think about the people who are on fixed incomes in particular who are now retired and absolutely unable to have these types of increases when they're not having any income increases, they're on fixed incomes. What is the demographic that you're seeing coming into your food bank? I mean, honestly, it's really everyone. You know, we're seeing food insecurity among seniors who are living on fixed incomes. That has grown quite a bit lately. We are also seeing, um, you know, veterans, families with children, um, low wage workers. I mean, honestly, even middle class families are struggling because here in Los Angeles, there's a severe lack of affordable housing. And so people are having to pay 50, 60, 70 percent of their income just to stay housed. And that doesn't leave a lot behind for um, the other basic needs. So we feel like if we can cover the food and provide consistent access to good, nutritious food, that means families can pay their rent. They can pay for child care. They can you know, seniors can get medicine. People can meet their other basic needs like utilities. And so we're consistently providing access to fresh, nutritious food so that people can be healthy, but also use their limited resources on the other really essential needs. Yeah, housing, the increase in housing has been absurd. You know, it used to be where it was like, okay, you could, your rent should be, or your mortgage or something should be like back in the day, it was like 25% of your income. And then it was 30% right. of your income. And now it's, I mean, it eats up most of everybody's income. And then you're right, they don't have anything really left over. And then with food prices increasing, how do you, how does, how does somebody even manage that? I mean, it's just, uh, I'm sure it's you've a real studied, challenge. it really is. I, I'm sure you've studied this a lot more than many of us have. I mean, many of us try to tackle what would solve homelessness or what would solve food insecurity um, people like look at, for example, Elon Musk, and they say, well, instead of spending $44 billion on Twitter, you could have solved hunger in America. Um, not really sure how accurate that really is, uh, because this is more of a systemic problem. It's not just a one time, as you know, you're feeding people all the time, and it's not like they need help once. And once you fed them and they're no longer hungry this month, they're hungry next month. So. What is it from your experience, everything that you've seen or that you've been researching and in, in being in this in this uh, in, in this sector for a long time? What do you think is really the root cause of this? Well, I think that that it really is systemic. There are a lot of root causes. You know, we were seeing um, food insecurity at an all time high even before the, the pandemic hit. And now it's just gone through the roof. And so, you know, it's a lot of things, certainly a lack of affordable housing. Um, I think there's you know, all of the, um, the issues are really interconnected. So while a food bank is meeting the immediate need, you know, we're providing food and making sure that especially children who, you know, they can't wait for a better economy to get the nutrition they need today. You know, so we're feeding people on a daily basis, but we are part of a network of agencies that work across all kinds of issues. So our member agencies provide other services like you know, addiction recovery, housing assistance, temporary housing, uh, domestic violence uh, shelters, um, you know, after school programs, senior programs. So we provide the food so that our member agencies can then focus their resources on providing other kinds of programs like vocational training and parenting assistance and the kinds of things that will help lift families out of poverty because we have to work on the immediate problem, but we also have to work on creating a society where so many people aren't left behind. Yeah, and it just seems to be a never ending cycle. I mean, if you, you know, you wanna better yourself, you wanna to go to school to get a better education so that you could get a better job, but you have to work during that time. So you have to somehow work school in on top of working in order to pay bills. And then if you've got kids, you got to figure out childcare that entire time, and that's outrageously expensive. And it just seems it's like really people hard. can never get ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I myself was in that position. You know, it was really getting a job at Westside Food Bank that helped me as a single mom lift my family out of poverty. 
But even then, that first year was really hard. My youngest child was, you know, four years old. I couldn't really afford childcare, and uh, we didn't have all day kindergarten yet. She wasn't old enough. And so I had a little desk next to my desk and I would bring her to work sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that was really helpful for me. I was really lucky. But a lot of parents don't have that option to bring their children to work. And childcare is so incredibly expensive. Yeah. So, you know, we're doing what we can. I know that I have to look at the problem that's in front of me every day, which is how do I provide really great food, the kind of food that I'd be proud to serve my own family. That's what we provide at Westside Food Bank. Yeah, I remember as a little as a little kid and my mom would have to cart me to college with her when she was trying to get her education. And there she was just this, you know, refugee from Vietnam, got this little toddler trying to get me to be quiet so that she could stay in class, which I don't know how successful that was because I don't <laughs> stay quiet. But I mean, I just, you know, it's, it's very difficult if you can't find somebody to help you with your children. If you can't, you know, there's just so many layers to this. I'm curious because I'm here in L.A. You're here in L.A. L.A. is one of the cities that has one of the worst problems, I would say, with homelessness and food insecurity. These really high priced cities um, have it's just on top of it because of the cost of living in these cities is so high. I'm just curious if you feel like any if the government here, if the L.A. City Council or if the state government, are they doing enough or is there something different they could do? Well, I think there's always more that can be done. You know, one thing that we can celebrate throughout the state of California is that, um, you know, we're passing universal school meals. So that means that children can get access to school meals without any stigma or shame. You yeah. know, I was recently part of a panel with the California Association of Food Banks uh, with those of us that have lived experience. And that idea of feeling shame every time you have to go get a, a free school lunch is just really terrible for children. So. That was one win that we had here in the state of California because of advocacy, um, you know, and there's only so much food banks can do. We really consider ourselves to be part of a greater network, not just with our member agencies, but also in partnership with government. I mean, what CalFresh can do is so much more than what food banks can do. And it also brings dollars into our economy. So we do everything we can to try to reduce barriers to accessing uh, CalFresh, which is what was you know, used to be called food stamps throughout the rest of the country. It's known as SNAP. You know, I remember being a family on SNAP and uh, there were times when you couldn't qualify if you owned a car. And I was like, listen, I have three young children. I'm trying to get a job. I can't give up my car to have food. Yeah. So thankfully, we've made some strides in, in reducing barriers to access to those programs. But there's more work to be done. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I used to live in Venice right on the boardwalk where there's a lot of homelessness. And um, I, I would hear people that would, you know, tourists that would kind of come through and they'd be like, why does that homeless person have a cell phone? Like if they can't afford, <laughs> you know, they should like prioritize their spending, right? They shouldn't have a cell phone. And I'm like, I mean, a cell phone is what, a hundred bucks a month versus your rent here in LA, which would be an out at least with their phone, they could maybe try to get a job. They could find food banks. They can find, mm -hmm. right. They have, they're able to get resources. I mean, the phone is kind of essential. Same thing when they say, well, how do they, why do they have a gym membership? And it's like, well, I mean, again, so that they could take a shower so they exactly. can, you know, I mean, there's things. So it's a kind of a lack of understanding and, and really pointing the finger at people and blaming them and saying, well, you're spending money on the wrong things like a car, you know, when, oh, well, if you're hungry, you shouldn't have this car. And it's like, well, I'm, I have a car so I could get to a job so that I don't have to be hungry anymore. You know, it's this exactly. people have to kind of connect I think it's the dots. important to come from a place of compassion because, you know, honestly, in America right now, I mean, there, but, you know, by the grace of God, go any of us. There's so many people who are one or two paychecks away from becoming homeless or being food insecure. And I think it's important to remember that we're talking about human beings and, yeah. you know, we have to have compassion. I remember being that single mom and, you know, there were times when I used my, my food stamp benefits to buy ready-made cupcakes so that my kid wouldn't be the only kid in class that didn't have cupcakes on their birthday. And maybe we ate rice and beans for the rest of the month, but that was my choice to, you know, to protect my children and, and try to give them some normalcy during a very difficult time. Yeah. Well, uh, Genevieve, how can we help? What can people, if, if people are able, I know right now it's tough for a lot of people, but you know, it's the holiday season. How, what can people do to help? Well, I would encourage people to support their food banks in their own communities. It's, there's a lot of great work being done on the local level all across the country. 
And if you're in the Los Angeles area, the Westside Food Bank right now, we have a really wonderful matching funds campaign going. It's called our Million Meals Match. And now through the end of December, every dollar that's donated will be matched, which means instead of providing food for four nutritious meals, every dollar provides food for eight nutritious meals. So even if you don't have much, a little bit can go a long way. And there's more information on our website, which is wsfb.org. And contributing to the Million Meals Match is a great and easy, fun, safe way to make a difference. Um, but there are ways to help throughout the year. We do an annual walkathon in the fall, our 5K Hunger Walk. We get hundreds of people out on the beach in Santa Monica and we walk to raise awareness. It's free to participate and there's fundraising that's optional. Um, you can volunteer in your community. We're actually about to move into a new annex warehouse because we've had to expand so much during the pandemic to meet you know, more than double the need of what we saw pre-pandemic, which was already really high. Um, but once we move into that, into that space in January, we'll be able to accept volunteers to help us sort food. Um, you know, there's all kinds of ways to help out, whether you're in this community or other communities, you know, reach out to your local food bank. It's, it's a great way to give back. And you're in one of those sectors where, you know, normally we would say congrats on your expansion, but in your situation, it's really not a good thing that you're having to expand and provide more food to people who are food insecure, who are experiencing hunger, who don't th feel, who, who just can't get enough to feed their families. It's really, really, um, so yeah, definitely Million Meals Match Campaign happening through December 31st. Um, I'm amazed that a dollar can feed can, can provide eight nutritious meals. That's incredible. It makes me feel like, because I know you're buying in bulk. I know you're getting things at, you know, you're, you're getting things at definitely a, a, a reduced rate for sure. But it just makes me think that they are inflating food costs at the grocery store for no real reason. That's what it makes me feel like when I hear yeah, that. Well, a dollar well, doesn't buy you anything buy at the grocery store. <laughs> and, you know, we also benefit from a lot of donated food. So, you know, there's some cost to handling donated food, but it's not the same as the cost for purchasing. Got and it. really we're about leveraging that economy of scale. That's why food banks exist. But I also wanted to just highlight, you know, some of the populations that people might be surprised to know are food insecure. You know, one of the things that we've seen lately is a real rise in college students that are food insecure. You know, even in our UC system, students at UCLA and UC Berkeley, these, you know, uh, banner schools, one in four students is food insecure. And when we're talking about community colleges, that looks like more than 75% of students are food insecure. So we've been expanding our programs to college students. We've been working with Santa Monica College, which has a huge uh, distribution. Not only do they do a weekly distribution, but they have um, a, a bodega market that's open uh, for free for students uh, five days a week, which is just incredible. We work with UCLA, we work with some of the other local colleges in our area. But I think people would be shocked to know that college students don't have enough to eat. Uh, yeah, I mean, that uh, it, that is definitely shocking. Students of any, you know, whether they be young students in schools and elementary and, and junior high and high school or whether it be college students should not be worrying about how they're going to feed themselves. Um, right. I, we I need these people to solve some of our big problems, right? We need them at yeah. their best. So right, exactly. that's why food banks are doing this kind of work to make sure we're providing food for college students, for, you know, the kids at the Boys and Girls Club who are getting you know, dinner every night from food from Westside Food Bank and other boys and girls clubs around the country are, are, are also providing meals. So it's a very important thing to do. Just makes me feel like our country has all the wrong priorities. I, you know, we just got to start taking care of our taking care of our citizens here and making sure uh, that this type of thing isn't happening. But um, Genevieve, thank you so much for your work. Thank you for sharing with us so that we can hopefully help, um, you know, just help out or just raise awareness on this the very important issue that is affecting so many Americans right now. Genevieve, thank you so much. The website again is wsfb.org. Thank you so much. And I, I just hope everyone remembers that the pandemic food insecurity crisis is not over. It's, it's actually getting worse because of inflation. And please remember to keep supporting your food banks, including Westside Food Bank. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. You are watching a preview of my upcoming Rumble exclusive live show, which will debut January 2nd. The new show will be live streamed for one hour, Monday through Friday, exclusively on Rumble. 
with segments released on other platforms. Be sure to follow me on Rumble so you never miss a show.